What is critical theory? This video discussion briefly sketches the meaning, origin, development, and key concepts in critical theory, the Frankfurt School tradition. It begins with a brief discussion on the founding of the Institute for Social Research in Frankfurt, Germany. As is well known, critical theory, the Frankfurt School tradition, can be traced its origin back to the Institute for Social Research. And then, this will proceed to the discussion on the meaning and key concepts of critical theory. Philo notes us to acknowledge the fact, however, that the concepts discussed here were taken mostly from Professor Jean-Philippe Durante's paper titled Critical Theory. In fact, at times Philo notes borrowed Durante's lines, and this is because this lecture is intended primarily as notes, that is, as a learning material for those who study critical theory, and the manuscript is not an academic paper intended for scholarly publication. Professor Durante is a faculty member of the Department of Philosophy at Macquarie University in Sydney, Australia. He is one of the leading figures in critical theory today. Now, as already mentioned, Critical theory, the Frankfurt School tradition, can be traced its origins back to the Institute for Social Research. Because of its location, which is also its current one, the Institute is also referred to as the Frankfurt School. Founded by Felix Weil, the Institute was officially established on the 3rd of February 1923, but it was conceptualized by Weil in 1922 by a decree of the Education Ministry. Felix Weil's father, Hermann, provided the initial annual funding of 120,000 marks, or 30,000 U.S. dollars. The Education Ministry suggested to call the Institute the Felix Weil Institute for Social Research, but Weil declined. This is because Weil wanted the Institute to become known and perhaps famous due to its contributions to Marxism as a scientific discipline and not due to the founder's name. Speaking of contributions to Marxism as a scientific discipline, it's important to note that at the core of the Institute's program is the revitalization of Marxism through a re-examination of the very foundations of Marxist theory, with a dual purpose of explaining past errors and preparing for future action. In fact, the Frankfurt School is a brainchild of the Erste Marxistische Arbeitswoche, or First Marxist Workweek, which met in the summer of 1922 in Ilmenau, Thuringia. The purpose of this meeting, according to Weil, was the hope that the different trends in Marxism, if afforded an opportunity of talking it out together, could arrive at a true or pure Marxism. Now, it is important to note, as we can already sense, that the Frankfurt School critical theorists, especially the early members, were devout Marxists. And because of the supposed failure of the Marxist revolutionaries to overthrow the capitalist order during the first quarter of the 20th century, as well as the rise of the Soviet Marxism, which gradually developed into Stalinism, the Frankfurt School critical theorists attempted to revitalize Marxism, or to speak very simply, to purge Marxism of the misconceptions and distortions that had shrouded Marxist scholarship during this time. Needless to say, the Frankfurt School critical theorists believe that Marxist philosophy remained the hope for the oppressed, those who had been disenfranchised by the capitalist order. A Taita Marxistische Arbeitswoche, or a Second Marxist Work Week, was proposed, but did not materialize because a more ambitious alternative took its place, that is, the founding of the Institute. It is interesting to note that Weil refused to habilitate himself and become a privat docent, or to consider the possibility of further academic advancement, which will lead to the directorship of the Institute because people may think that he bought the finia legendi, or later the chair. As we already know, holding a chair, or chair professor, 
as a governmentally salaried full professor at the Goethe University Frankfurt or Frankfurt University is a requirement for the directorship of the institute. Now here are the early leaders of the institute. Kurt Albert Gerlach was the first director of the institute. He was described by his friend Friedrich Pollock as a non-party socialist. Karl Grunberg was the second director of the institute who was an avowed Marxist. Grunberg was an Austrian and professor of law and political science at the University of Vienna. Interestingly, Grunberg was also the first avowed Marxist who hold a chair professor at a German university. Max Horkheimer became the director of the institute in July 1930, but officially installed in January 1931. With Horkheimer, the institute entered its period of great productivity. And with the leadership of Horkheimer, the institute has assumed a new direction, that is, from an attempt to revitalize and re-examine Marxism to an attempt to critique and change the pathological society as a whole. With this, critical theory was born. And so, what is critical theory? The term critical theory first appeared in Max Horkheimer's famous article titled Traditional and Critical Theory, published in 1937. According to Durante, this article acts like a Bible for critical theory. In this article, Horkheimer identified the distinctive parameters that characterize the collaborative research program of the Institute. On the one hand, according to Horkheimer, traditional theory refers to the positivistic and idealistic conception of theoretical inquiry. In other words, traditional theory treats theory as being independent of concrete social and historical realities. It is important to note that in positivism, especially logical positivism, every rationally justifiable assertion can be scientifically verified or is capable of logical proof. In fact, the positivistic and idealistic conceptions of theory have the tendency to naturalize the phenomenon studied, for example, laws and facts. Thus, in traditional theory, according to Herkheimer, Laws and facts are interpreted as though they are not strongly influenced by the general social condition in which these laws and facts are found. On the other hand, critical theory is critical not in the Kantian sense, that is, a critique of reason's power by reason alone, but in the sense of Marx's critique of the political economy. In Kant's Transcendental Idealism, we learn that critique means examining and establishing the limits of the validity of knowledge. Kant's critique of reason involved the critique of dogmatic theology and metaphysics, and is intertwined with the enhancement of ethical autonomy and the Enlightenment's critique of superstition and irrational authority. But critical theory stems from a Marxist inspiration. Marx uses the term critical in his famous work Capital, or Das Kapital, subtitled A Critique of Political Economy, as a way to demonstrate why and in what sense capitalism is suspect. In other words, Marx uses the term critical both to demonstrate the origins of political economy in order to expose its limitations and to supply a better explanation of the nature and dynamics of capitalism. Thus, being critical necessarily implies being dialectic. Thus, next to Marx, according to Durante, Hegel is the second reference for critical theory. Given that the critical theory is founded on concrete social realities, that is to say, that the critical theorists need to understand the society in great details, then the critical theorists of society must follow the examples of great sociologists, like Emile Durkheim and Max Weber, and study social facts and laws. But they must do so in a dialectic fashion. That is, first, 
critical theorists of society must highlight in what way these social facts and laws combined to form an unjust and inhumane society, and in what way social life, as it were, contradicts itself. And second, critical theorists must pinpoint forces in the social world, or agents of social transformation, that can carry the promise of emancipation. Now, according to Durante, we can derive two fundamental implications from this vision of the dialectic nature of a critical theory of society. Durante believes that these two implications are the two features which, when taken together, demarcate critical theory from other forms of social and political theory. In fact, according to Durante, they serve as the litmus test in deciding whether a contemporary social theory can be called critical theory, of course, the Frankfurt School tradition. Now, the first implication, according to Durante, concerns methodology. Critical theory's methodology is dialectic because it envisages a substantial link between theory, or philosophy for Adorno, and empirical social and human sciences, especially sociology, political science, economics, and psychology. Here, theory provides the general conceptual grammar that can unite the diverse descriptions borrowed from the social sciences. In fact, throughout the generations of critical theory, this relationship between philosophy and empirical science remains one of mutual correction and enrichment. Thus, such a conceptual framework or theory is not constructed a priori, but is informed by the most relevant human and social sciences. Reciprocally, the empirical information or praxis receives a new systematic meaning by being integrated and unified in a framework that it cannot independently establish. Now, the second implication concerns the unity of theory and praxis. The historical self-awareness of critical theory means that it is conscious of participating in the very historical time it studies. Thus again, the relation between social theory and social reality is a relation of reciprocal dependence. On the one hand, Theory receives its fundamental impetus from extra-theoretical interests. This means that theoretical endeavors find leading clues about the reality they study in the experience of individual and collective dissatisfaction with existing social order, as well as in the aspirations expressed most notably by social movements that struggle for emancipation. On the other hand, Theory also aims to have practical relevance by clarifying the core concepts, norms, and values with which to describe the social experience in both its negative and positive aspects. Lastly, the Frankfurt School had already spanned three generations since its inception, and some of the most notable members of the first generation are Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, Herbert Marcuse, and Walter Benjamin, while Jürgen Habermas and Axel Honneth represented the second and third generations respectively. And we also have postmodernism that involves Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, Jean Baudria, and Jean-François Lutat. It is important to note that postmodernism is not part of critical theory, the Frankfurt School tradition. But this is included in the diagram just to show that almost at the same time when Habermas was busy formulating his brand of critical theory, there was another famous philosophical movement that was developing in France, namely postmodernism.